Well, happy new year to you out there, diggity donks. Hi there, my name is Luke Thomas, and this is a special bonus episode of Morning Combat. Not the real Morning Combat, but you know, a little extra something something to get you through your weekend. Uh, as I mentioned, of course, I'm one half of the normal Morning Combat hosting duo. My name is Luke Thomas, I'm from CBS Sports. The gentleman that you, I don't know if he's gonna, I don't know how they're gonna put this together, but he's either on the other side of your screen or we're gonna flash to him in just a second. But either way, it is my friend and yours, also from CBS Sports, while my family decides to have a quinceanera outside my my door as soon as we start <laughs> recording the podcast. It's Brian Campbell. What's up, Brian? Hello, Luke. It, uh, it was a crazy year, 2020. Uh, the last couple of weeks were really crazy, but uh, it's over. 2021 begins, and I just want to point out, while your favorite, meaning the viewers out there, uh, if you're on the fence about this show, while your favorite combat sports show is taking the holidays off, we are going out of our way to fill your holiday holes, your in-holes, uh, your in-seam with nothing but more morning combat so uh this is a nice bonus for y'all hope you enjoy it um hey look shout out to the nice people at uh, bellator mma for this uh little little uh, piece of business right here okay? did they send that to you they did they did you notice luke you know whether it's showtime bellator uh cbs sports <laughs> i get really nice merch and each time luke's like who sent that to you i didn't get that yet who did that who who sent yeah. you you know yeah i didn't i don't i don't uh, wait, wait, listen to this though you're right. I don't get sent shit. I mean, Showtime claims that there's some all the smoke swag headed my way. We'll see. But it doesn't really matter, BC, because either way, no matter what any of these people send you or me, they don't send us gift packages like they send Esther Lynn gift packages. Did you see her unwrap that? I mean, that looked like somebody at the most high end department store imaginable put together oh, yeah. the best That's gift you can think of. Shout out to Esther Lynn, by the way. Love her work, uh, our Showtime colleague. And, and uh, right. uh, yeah, I didn't get that one. Um, I did, yeah. by the way, our, our producer, Mikey Mormal, just let us know over the chat that uh, he also got that Bellator gift package. So it was a nice holiday, you know, uh, how are you from Bellator? And I love those folks as well, Luke. I love all the yeah. fighters, okay? I yeah, love, I, don't get, I, don't, races, I, don't I don't get packages like that. They don't like me like that. So well, what yeah. are you going to do? Uh, how you know what what do you get a guy who has it all luke okay you already got a big package right, right? yeah, <laughs> yeah. they all couldn't right. get me another reverse hyper bc because i've already gotten one uh, yeah. all right so uh, today's they couldn't is get you another chip for your shoulder luke because it's barely you're barely holding it up right now okay <laughs> you know what i need some help i need a spotter for that chip i thought you'd be that guy but the quarantine <laughs> has kept you away from me you know uh, yeah, i'll say this bc today's show will be short and, and relatively speaking and will very it, though, simple luke will it actually be short because i'm ready to well, interrupt you and go on some long tangents and maybe i'll create a hit list of uh of, of people who came for my profession luke and uh and you know in 2021 well, today we'll is it. today is about moving on from some of these past grudges all lang syne and all that kind of good stuff uh, usually we'd have a Friday episode today, and usually what that would mean is we would go over Monday's homework. So Monday's homework was to watch the 1996 action movie by Don Simpson and Jerry Bruckheimer known as The Rock. Now, not The Rock as in Dwayne Johnson, the wrestler, but The Rock, the movie named after the former, and now, well, not, I guess it's closed, but as a, as a uh, it was a prison, Alcatraz, I guess now it's a tourist sort of stop but well it was closed way, then that was, too luke it was closed when they made the film too right they, it, it was, was yeah i think it closed in, i don't know 60s or 70s but suffice to say we would ordinarily be talking about that on a friday episode so no normal friday episode but we did want to make sure that we got to that as a little bit of bonus content to talk about the movie the rock now i had seen this movie a million times this is one of my favorite action movies and i was very surprised because BC had gone on a military movie tour, and this isn't exactly that. This is, it involves the military, but in terms of like military movies, it's somewhat military adjacent in that way. Yeah, this is an Never action the, movie. This is straight up yeah. an action movie. I mean, it's not as che perfectly cheesy as a Stallone, Schwarzenegger, Seagal flick, but it's more in that vein than it is a war movie by any stretch of the imagination. All right, so there's a lot to get to here, but I think the first thing that's most appropriate is I've already seen it. Lots of the audience has either already seen it or watched it, but you were kind of the focus of this one, BC, because we had not heard from you yet about what you felt about it. You saw it this week. Let's start with a bit of an overview. I don't mean the plot line. I mean, did you like this? I loved it. I loved it. I watched it with my tw uh, twin 12 year old sons. They were very excited to, uh, you know, get with dad, watch an R rated flick. And uh, look, it had, I, here's the deal. 
I, I again, I said this the other day. I can't explain why I never saw it. It just didn't happen, right? I mean, again, I saw Con Air. I saw Face Off, Sudden Death, all the ones, all the contemporaries around that. I tended to avoid the non-Star Wars sci-fi flicks. I didn't see Independence Day, that kind of crap. But uh, this was in my wheelhouse. I missed it. So it was really fun to go back to a great time, the 90s, right? This came out my senior year of high school. Uh, and what a freaking incredible cast. That's the first thing that jumped off. So did I love the movie? I loved it. My sons loved it. It's an action flick that was done really well without getting too cheesy, even though there is some really good one-liners in it, without getting too what action movies try to do, which is make it an action movie for everybody, right? Where they make it a little too safe. We didn't really have that. We had some pretty awesome deaths in this one. You know what I'm saying? This was a pretty damn manly action movie. Again, without going too far into that other area, which is my preferred area, the Steven Seagal ridiculous sort of category. This was like a straight up down the middle, almost like Seagal's Under Siege Part 1, which really attempted to be a blockbuster. Everyone can watch it, but still pretty pretty manly action flick. Uh, this one is maybe the best in that genre. And I I mean, this is a fantastic flick, top to bottom. I was enthralled. I had some fist pump moments. I had some, oh my God, moments when people were brutally killed. And what held it all together was certainly Sean Connery, who had, he was almost as important to this movie, Luke, as Heath Ledger was to that Batman one you made me watch, right? Mm. Right? Like he was the M freaking VP of this movie, yet it wasn't him carrying the flick. It was such a great ensemble. I mean, there were great actors who played very small. John C. McGinley playing a very small role. What I loved most about this flick was that two, two things going on simultaneously. One, not as important, but awesome. They had no problem killing people off. People that you thought may have been there for the whole flick are just gone. I love that. I love that moment when it's down to just Sean Connery and Nicolas Cage and all the guys that came in there with are gone. Did not see that coming while I was watching it live, right? I assume this was going to be a much more, much bigger production of, of two, you know, mini armies going head to head. So anytime they were just ready to just kill off somebody, you're like, okay, this is going to keep me on the edge of my seat. But what I really loved, uh, and it's sort of the, the heart, uh, I think of what, what really made me um, enjoy this flick was, I, I forgot, Luke, I forgot where I was going right there, but uh, Luke, uh, it'll come back to me. My whole point here is this was just really well done for an action movie. There was a lot yeah. of effort put into it. Um, and it had, had, again, had touches of cheesiness that we love, but Connery was a freaking stud. You had star power across the board. Oh, and I got it now. The, the, the reason I loved it the most you never knew who was good or bad at any point in any kind of flick or dot or, or seer, you know, show or anything, Luke, that can, you know, the, that can, the, the wire was great at this, right. And they're showing you all facets of every character where at certain points you're like, Oh, that's a good guy. No, now he's bad now. Or he's a bad guy with good intentions. Oh no, he's a good guy, but now he's doing some bad things. There was a steady run of that throughout the whole flick where, you know, you weren't sure who to cheer for at certain points in that ambiguity ambiguousness ambiguity if you will william and mary um you think they banged by the way who william and mary i don't think it's quite how it works but go ahead okay uh that constant ambiguity luke is really what i think was the you know the blood the heart and soul that kept this thing going that even like you know i started the movie cheering for edward then i realized he's a batshit crazy villain then, of course, you're cheering for Nicolas Cage against him. But then at the end, you're like, you know, I can almost sympathize with what Ed, Ed Wood, right? Is that what I'm talking about? Ed Wood. Ed Harris? Ed Harris. All right, Ed Harris. Yeah. Luke, we may want to re-record this after I get a uh, lobotomy, okay? Oh, uh, yeah, Ed Harris, Luke. Um, and I think that was the part that I loved most, that they really presented, you know, convicts with hearts and government officials who were obviously up to no good. And it was up to you to sort of decode who really was the, uh, you know, the hero and the villain in this one. Yeah, I mean, the central tension is there's no way to root for the VX gas, right? The VX gas just sort of stays awful. Your first introduction to it in the movie when they try to steal it from that compound and they lose one of their own, you see how, you know, just terribly vicious it is. You can't really cheer for hostage taking. You can't really cheer for um, the VX gas being dumped in the streets of San, Franci San Francisco and obviously spoilers at this point, but... But the key for me is, you're right, there's a little bit of 
uh, okay, well, Ed Harris is going to extreme measures, um, but at the same time, maybe he has some cause for that. And yes, the FBI and uh, whoever else is right to want to take down these VX gas rockets, but at the same time, you know, they kept Mason under wraps without trial for three decades and blah, blah, blah. Like, there is a little bit of everything you dislike about the government being there, but they do have an important role to play. Conversely, there's everything you like about this, frankly, what they were, you know, mercenaries, vigilantes, whatever. Um, but at the same time, their mission was just basically untenable. And in the end, it really comes to a point when Sean Connery confronts uh, Ed Harris's character and, you know, quotes Oscar Wilde to him about patriotism being a virtue of the wicked. And and that at that point, there's no going back with the moral ambiguity. I think at that point, the movie tries to crystallize it all for you. But you're right, like, about why this movie works. They played with that. Um, this was one of the movies that was done as a tandem. Don Simpson and Jerry Bruckheimer for years were a tandem. If you go and look at old movies, in fact, I think this was their last one together. But if you go back and look at old movies that Bruckheimer was involved in, it was always a Simpson-Bruckheimer co-production. And um, I don't know if it was like a Lennon-McCartney thing where one kind of balanced out the other or maybe one was more talented than the other. And it is true that Bruckheimer had some big hits after this one, but it just felt like everything was well-balanced in this movie, dude. I mean, you had just the, amount, uh, just the right amount of violence, but you also had a lot of levity. You know, you had the seriousness of Sean Connery's character with Nicolas Cage being sort of this bumbling lab rat. You had the seriousness I mean, of Ed well, Harris. Pause right there. Their 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 bro ke chemistry, their bro mystery was very reminiscent yeah. of ours, right? I, I'm good speed in this in this package, right? You're. Um, I I don't think you understand yourself very well. <laughs> very well. I don't think you're the guy that went to Columbia and Johns Hopkins, and yet you're also that guy. I mean, which which guy are you? Are you the factory town guy or not? But okay. The point being is they had tremendous chemistry, tremendous chemistry in this one. And then you also had Ed Harris sort of being the foil of this stuffed up 33 year old chief of staff, uh, White House chief of staff, uh, Sinclair, right? So there was all these sort of opposites that played off of each other to the point you just raised the immoral ambiguity at times. And then of course you had the scene of the rock versus uh, San Francisco, the tranquility, the, the peace, the harmony, uh, versus the sort of rugged, awful place that is now being used for potentially um, uh, dire purposes. So there, it just, there's just total balance that is brought to this. And also, it deserves to be noted, like, the individual actors themselves, I thought, killed it. I thought Ed Harris knows that he knows how to play military generals basically better than anybody. And Sean Connery, it wasn't a huge departure from the 007 role, to be quite honest with you. And then you had Nicolas Cage, who at the time, that was like, 96 was what, peak Nicolas Cage? I mean, I realized oh, yeah. he's still out there making movies, but that was like his time. And hold on, I wanna, add, I wanna drop a little sauce on top of what you're saying. Uh, ultimately, I, you know, I'd said what you just echoed, which was, you know, the performances, the ensemble cast is really what, what legitimized this movie. And it was their commitment to their performances. And what I mean by that, Luke, is, if you're going to make a big action movie with ensemble cast, right? You're going to make the Expendables. It's an all-star game. These guys are accepting their paycheck. They're coming on for fun. Let's have a good fun. They're going out there. They're just effing around, right? I felt that all of these names, even in somewhat small roles, even a John C. McGinley, right? Who got killed off pretty early in this one, committed to that role of a level of seriousness, even though it's a, a, a you know, mainstream action flick which can come with it again, a lot of levity, a lot of like, hey, if we if we soften it enough, we can get the wives in the theater. You know what I mean? We can get grandma in the theater, right? So, But yet everybody stuck to a very serious performance. And really, you know, if, if Sean Connery's the MVP, um, Ed Wood Harris was the, you know, the, the unsung hero. And I and before we move on and go too far away from this, uh, the more immoral Im ambiguity, Luke, I feel like there was a long stretch where he was sort of the hero of this movie in a weird way. Like, okay, he, 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 he corralled hostages, right? Uh, villain move. He threatened the use of, uh, you know, biochem, you know, <laughs> weapons that would have effed up, uh, you know, generations. But when, when given the opportunity to hit the button, he couldn't do it. Right. You know what I mean? He, de he, he, de and I'm not trying to, you know, say he shouldn't have uh, been killed or shouldn't have spent his life in prison afterwards. I'm just saying that I think they identified enough that here was a hero 
who wasn't treated like one throughout his military career or, you know, I mean, despite all the medals, he saw his brethren around him and their families get effed over. So he had a grub, uh, a real grudge that he was willing to sort of risk the rest of his life and, and, and corral this group of guys who were willing to take a million dollars and the knowledge that they can never step foot in their country again for the somewhat Robin Hood esque hope of bringing, you know, light and money to other families who had lost uh, soldiers to secret missions that were never made public. So I'm saying that, like, yeah, it was wrong what he did, but as ridiculous as that spiel that I just said, he was he was he committed to the role enough where you were like, I, I get it, he's crazy, but I get it, he's trying to do something good here. He's just doing something very extreme. Yeah, I mean, going back to his character, General Hummel. You know, do you do you remember the opening scene where he goes and visits his wife's grave and he puts the medal on top of her grave? That was the Congressional Medal of Honor that he put on her grave. You know what I mean? Like, this is a guy who was squeaky clean, highest honors you could get in the military. They read them off at the beginning after, you know, in, the, in that meeting between all the military generals and the FBI. He had just virtue, you know, at the wazoo. His message about those guys being done wrong and having lived through that, totally unassailable. Uh, and then wanting something for them by itself unassailable. The the thing that turns the movie on its head is, to your point, the extreme length he went to to get that. And that's what undoes it. That's what gives the government just the um, just a little bit of the moral upper hand in that equation where you're like, no matter what you think about Hummel and his mission, you can't let VX gas just be rained down upon civilians. I mean, that's but I don't where. think he ever had attention to. Let's get inside his head for a second. Yeah, okay, but, okay, well, okay, but but doesn't. But but here's the thing: you don't really know that <clears throat> until Connery makes it explicit, saying, "I looked in his eyes. He's a soldier, not a murderer, or whatever the." Uh, I think the difference ultimately between you and Hummel, and you know, you and then Hummel and me, Hummel and I together, we're of one mind here is that you think they're conspiracy theories. Hummel and I know they're just theories, right? I mean, he lived it. He, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like he knows the government secrets. He knows where the bodies are buried, right? I, I like how you watch a fictional tale of, you know, literally Jerry Bruckheimer proportions. And you're like, this certifies my fucked up worldview. Yeah, wow yeah right you know uh we, <laughs> tune in tune in for my risen 26 recap more to come uh no more news at 11 all right yes, uh, yes. But in, in, in general in general you're right i mean i think you would agree though that like there was plenty of action there wasn't necessarily the most amount of dialogue but i kind of felt like with the dialogue dude they made pretty good use of it like in general uh especially especially through stanley goodspeed through him and his exasperation where, you know, my favorite line, because I take pleasure in gutting you, boy. And then he's sitting in the jail cell going over that line over and over and over again. Or when his girl proposes to him, he's like, whoa, marriage police, pull over. And then they're banging. And she's like, he's like, I got to go. And she's like, well, why do you have to go? It's like, I, work is calling. She's like, you don't have to go. He's like, uh, how, she goes, how, did, how do they know you're here? It's like, well, it's the FBI. Like, there's just sort of these moments where it's not a ton of dialogue. But the one-liners pop and land all. And you the way have to admit out. that Nicolas Cage walked a tightrope, and what I mean by that is we've seen him pull off uh, Oscar-worthy performances, right? Leaving Las Vegas, even though he's playing a very unique and extreme character, we've seen him pull it together, Luke, and be an incredible actor. And then we've seen a lot of face-off bullshit, right? And even though the that bullshit's been fun, I went to a lot of Con Airs and face-offs, right? They were fun action movies, but you knew you were getting cheese. This was a production in which they said, okay, Nicolas Cage, people love you because you can pull off the cheese, but let's take that cheese and let's just shave a little bit of the, of the uh, aged parts off and let's try to keep you crazy, but put you through this, uh, through this, you know, this prism of, 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 I mean, he walked the damn tightrope and I think he pulled off his performance perfectly where we got enough comedy from him without him being a complete joke. And he had to do some things that weren't a joke, right? Like he had to be the bumbling guy with three weeks of, of actual combat experience before he went into a career of, you know, bioterrorism and labs, put on the gun and, and get back in there and, and, you know, be a man and, and, and carry out a mission. And, and I thought even for as ridiculous as that may have looked on a script, he pulled it off perfectly, Luke. So he, again, yeah. big, big, big part of, of why this flick was able to toe that line and be a great 
action movie and not just something that like you and your dudes would watch uh drinking uh beast ice out of a can you know yeah yeah and then also um you know they didn't ask him to do too much i mean there's a couple of times where he rose to the occasion where he stuffed the vx gas in the guy's mouth at the end there but in general if you think about what he was doing like in in the uh, the the one thing i thought that was a little bit over the top excuse me was the car chase where he is driving you know through literally buildings and glass walls and everything and a stolen car and then a stolen bike that part was a little bit where they asked him to do things that i didn't think he necessarily was capable of doing but once they got to the rock yes he was firing guns and stuff like that but for the most part he was covering up he was running from the Marines, and all he was really trying to do was take out the guidance chips, which you could actually kind of believe, you know, not only that he could do that, but he'd be the guy for that. So in general, not totality, but in general, they asked each guy to do the things that they were basically best situated to do. That's I think it's another reason why it works. And I don't want you to somewhat poo-poo on that car chase scene, because I want to hit that early and say that, that was freaking awesome. And every great it was. action It just movie, it's like it's like this guy's a chemical agent, he can drive a Ferrari like that. Right. And, so. and look, and we were, we're gonna get into shortly the the parts of the presentation that were, you know, suspension of disbelief and oh, okay, well, this is an action movie, guys. It's not a real movie, I can tell. Like, whatever. Yeah, this car chase scene flirted with that. But what a great piece of cinema cinema they put out there, Luke. I mean, this, you know, right away, I'm like, that reminded me of that great chase scene in Point Break, the original, right? Where it's one camera following. This wasn't one camera, but what I'm saying is that scene is like the, the takeaway from that movie. That was a great flick. Saw it in the theater. And I came out telling everybody, oh, my God, that chase scene is so badass. I love that they committed to early in this movie this sort of over-the-top thing that really didn't matter as much in the script, Right. Like, okay, it showed you that that Sean Connery... See, that's Connery... why I wasn't the biggest fan. See, that's why I wasn't the biggest fan of it. I'll, I'll pitch it back to you, but here's... I'll just say it very quickly. The chase scene by itself was good, if not great, and especially with the trolley car going way in the air. Like, if you're going to do a chase scene, it should be kind of like that. Chaotic and violent and weird and blah. But it's like, once they got to The Rock, none of that shit mattered. <laughs> they just basically, it's like, you to have a modern action movie, and this is 1996, so it's not that far away from us, you have to have a chase scene. Let's just put one in there. It was like, eh. All right. Well, look, I loved it. There's no chance that black guy in the trolley car would have survived under any circumstances. And he walked out without a scratch and still had some funny one-liners of, oh, you know, some, oh, shit type of moments. But, uh, yeah, and maybe, maybe Cage is not going to be able to handle Ferrari that easily and drive through windows to be able to keep up with Connery. But, um, Luke, were you upset at all in terms of believability that after that chase scene, the authorities are still like, all right, this guy just killed a whole bunch of people with a chase scene, caused millions of dollars in destruction, but we're still going to use him on this mission, right? You know what I mean? Like, uh, the, the, see, of all the things that were suspension of disbelief, that where I was like, really? I think they would just kill him right there, right? Yeah, they'd probably be pretty fucking upset at that point. Um, and the, the stuff with him driving with Sean Connery, again, he's sort of believable in that role. Plus, he was driving a, a Hummer, you know, and then they, he stole the guy's Hummer at the concierge, and he's like, D don't touch my hummo any scratches dings nicks i have your ass and then he still took it anyway and then okay all right mickey rooney here can we can we pull back a little bit on oh, the, the guy's accent was german are we gonna right. worry about Luke, the german people now at this point? f with accents okay the germans will they'll get you all right thank you <laughs> Okay, but all the right. point being is the guy had a even his accent. Those was sort of, people, sort of those people will get you. Debt left shrimp, line one. Okay, Luke, he's coming for your ass. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, it was fine. It was a great, you know, big moment in the movie in terms of like giving audiences what they want. I looked up the release date, BC, June seventh of nineteen ninety six. So this was a big summer blockbuster. I guarantee you, they had some Hollywood meeting and they're like, you got to have a chase scene. You gotta, you gotta put a chase scene in there. You gotta make it happen. So they put they they they. You know they uh, they arranged the script and the plot to to account for one, uh, and it was fine. It wasn't bad. It was just like it's kind of like really you got to have a nude scene, stress. which this didn't have. This didn't have a nude scene. It had a quasi questionable sort of sex scene that led to that phone call. But were you upset at all, loving the action movie genre like I do, that we didn't see anybody pop out of a cake or anything, Luke? I mean, it would have really made the movie what a little bit more than what it was, I suppose, in terms of like checking off all the boxes. But in, in terms of this movie being over and feeling satisfied at the experience, I never felt like that was missing. Okay. I never felt like, oh, um, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say it wouldn't have been great to see, 
or something like uh what was the movie where uh the high school football movie where she was wearing all the whipped cream um, uh yeah the, friday uh, night lights yeah i i no it's not friday it's uh i don't want your life your life yeah what I the mean, hell is that called texas F- to uh fr- uh uh yeah, I'm pretty know. sure it's Friday Night Lights, but whatever it's called. No, 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 that's not that. That was a legitimate movie. Friday Night Lights was like a actual legitimate movie. This was um, I'll just look it up, Luke, because people are really angry. They're they're like, how could you not know this? All right. Uh, but the point being is that's a pretty memorable moment. This one doesn't have any of that, um, but it has a, a lot of other things. All right, so let's get to what Varsity you didn't Blues, like about the movie. Luke. Varsity, Varsity Blues. Blues. Okay. okay. What what did you not like about it? There's not a ton. There's really not a ton I didn't like. I I, th- I felt the like we like you laid out Cage's ability to, to disarm the weapons was was fairly fairly believable. Um, there was a huge stretch and a leap again from the government trusting Sean Connery's character, uh, you know, putting him in a, a situation to succeed and eventually escape, and maybe there was um. I, you know, a little bit of a stretch of the imagination or the whole tunnels and, you know, no one's been down there in 40 years, but I'm sure we can just grab a huge team and go down to the tunnel and, and get there. Probably the one moment, though, that I was most like, oh, come on, is when the president gave the go ahead to, to, to just bomb the island, which, you know, at some point as you're watching, it, you're like, it's, you know, when you weigh the we know they have chemical weapons. We know the guy's probably crazy enough to hit the button. We know that's going to have a huge thing or we can kill 67 people here. Um, You figure they're going to shoot that airplane down in rural Pennsylvania. Right. And the president, mm-hmm. to his credit, fictionally here, made that really hard decision and did it. And then there's like a 15 minute gap where you're just like, uh, these bombs are going to come any second now. And, you know, and then there you finally, after like 10 minutes, there's a guy in an airplane going seven minutes until no, the, the, I would have to believe Luke that there's a period of time between the president saying yes. And then you enter a few codes and someone's hitting a damn button. Okay. I don't know why that stuck with me as sort of, um, like at that moment, I'm like, okay, this is a Nicolas Cage action movie. This isn't a cinematic right. masterpiece, right? You know what I mean? Right. But with that, that was, said, to me, that was like not only just not all that believable, his furrowed brow speech about patriotism, because he even says, you know, uh, more or less, right? The the president talking how Hummel was a man of honor and and that he was right about the people being left behind, and America has a debt to pay to them but we're still going to bomb you bitches back to the <laughs> to the stone age. You know, it's like, uh, yeah, this movie's falling apart a little bit here. Um, I, I don't think uh, that Goodspeed's wife or, 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 you know, future fiance, Vanessa Marcel, I feel like her whole role was really just like marginalized and just dropped in as a prop. Like we should probably have some form of high profile female and we should probably have a love interest to, to create some element here for Goodspeed. But I feel like not only was it just sort of rushed and, and you know, the, the movie really lacks lacked a strong female role, whether it was a female badass member of the attack team, you know, or whether it was her having more dialogue and playing up more the conflict of like, that's my husband in there. I've got a baby here. It was just very touched on. And then when you mix that with like, they let her like on the front lines in the control room with like the top guys. That's not happening, Luke. Okay. They are not allowing her to sit like next to the head of the FBI and the, uh, you know, whatever, while they're making the decisions and her like arguing with them. Like that's not going to happen. These, those little parts really stuck me a little bit, but even with a over the top ending, it, it held together. Well, yes. I mean, it was over the top of constant, like, can they, you know, get there in time and put up the flares before the, the planes come by and drop the bombs, all that, you know, again, they walked a tightrope. It was a little ridiculous. It was an action movie by the end of it, but damn right. By the time Nicholas cages is, is got the, the flares out and he's falling backwards in such a dramatic moment. And the planes are coming over and abort abort. Like that's a great ass moment. All of that Luke leads me to the other issue. Is the whole stabbing in the heart thing real? And number two, if there's yes. any way you can stab yourself in the heart with some kind of medicine to stop your skin from bulging and dying, could Cage just bounce back from that in like six seconds and go on to save the rest of the world like he did? Well, he took the atropine, then got blown up, and it was actually Sean Connery who pulled him out of the water. So Mm-mm. sort of, maybe. Cage got up. I don't know. Cage got up from the stabbing. And went on to oh, do to, some to, other to put things. the flares to put the flares still barely. I mean, barely. He could barely do it. 
their atrophy in Israel. Um, I, you know, I, I, if you actually notice where he stabs himself in the movie, it's like in his stomach. It's actually yeah. nowhere near his heart. I was but like, you'd okay. have to believe there's a there's a element of error in there. Like you could probably kill yourself very easily stabbing your own heart with atrophy. Correct. Yes, and then we were not even talking about the opening scene with the cockroaches and at the FBI headquarters. Uh, you know, where they get mailed the package with the doll that spits out the gas and blah, 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 which is also sort of a fun, interesting moment uh, at the beginning of the movie. I, th I think these are all reasonable conclusions. You're right. There was no female role here whatsoever that frankly mattered. I mean, there was there, the character of Vanessa Mar Marcel introduced levity and a little bit of sadness. But, but you're right. She was just there to bring in elements to the movie that otherwise would not be there. She had no identity really beyond that, um, quite candidly. Same with Sean Connery's daughter. She's mm -hmm. just designed to be humanizing for him. That's really so I, kind of yeah. the whole thing. I actually, it's crazy for me to say it, a lover of action movies and death and violence when it gets to this level, that I was actually looking for more of a plot development in some of those slow moments and we didn't get it, um, which was weird and interesting. I also thought that Ed Harris for all the commitment to the storyline and what his role mattered, he deserved some kind of a little bit more of a dramatic death. I thought. Yeah. Oh, the question was, does a guy like that deserve a death of nobility or not? You know? And I think they kind of struggle with how to do that exactly. And I don't, I don't think they quite pulled it off. It wasn't bad what happened, but it wasn't maybe exactly what you would have expected given the, the I mean, he was the catalyst for all of this. So you would have thought that the death would have been one way or the other, maybe more dramatic. I think that's a good point as well. I think it deserves to be noted. One, we didn't talk about it, but I thought the score of this movie was actually quite good. You know, big, you know, bold sounds, da -na 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 -na, all you know, full of patriotism and whatnot. But the thing I didn't like about this movie is sort of a smaller note. I mean, I love this movie, but if I had to say things I didn't like, you mentioned there was no female leads of any kind of significant way. Dude, they, they kind of, I mean, this is the 90s. You forget how, like, discriminatory it was back then. We always talk about, like, going back to the 80s and how, like, fucked up watching some of those movies are, you know? Yeah. Here you had the black woman in prison screaming about her gun. You had the black guy who drove the trolley car screaming about how he was going to fuck everybody up. You just, you, you didn't have any prominent black female or black roles whatsoever. And then the ones you did were sort of typecast over the top characters, right? They didn't, I mean, you, yeah. there's not like a I mean, listen, it's not like, oh, I need to have a diversity quota in every single movie ever. No, but if there are literally no major black characters whatsoever, and then the only ones who have memorable lines are the ones who are, you know, screaming about being done wrong in subservient roles, you might want to rethink how you're putting black people in the movie. And you I know, was going to say, the, the strongest... The strongest role of, of black people were the two Marine recon guys who end up turning on Ed Harris and that they were presented as badasses. They were strong. Uh, I so thought just it was, the one. Yet, oh, wait, no, no, there was two. There was two. There yeah, was but, there two. Was but yet at the one, end of the day, one kind of, one of kind of wrestled with it. Yes. At the end of the day, they're sort of just raging a holes that were there as pawns. I get the point you're saying. And I, you know, I didn't know if you want to extend that further across any other lines of race and say, you know, they needed more, but uh, you know, look, th th these are the small things that maybe kept it from perfect. But it was uh, it was pretty damn amazing, Luke, across the yes. board. I mean, this was a great action in the action genre, which, again, it's hard in the action genre to make a movie that's going to get like legitimately, uh, you know, high praises critically from people who are looking at all of the things that were very on the surface level touching on, you know, things like the score and the cinematography and the presentation of roles and all that. But, dude, they came pretty damn close. And again, let's circle back. Sean Connery was what was he 66 when he filmed this movie and he was out of his mind great in this he was right. as he was a 10 out of 10 in terms of a cool factor in terms of delivering even some crappy one line and you know comebacks he delivered it with swagger the whole haircutting scene throwing the guy over the side of the building I mean everything about that whole sequence to establish his badassery was top shelf uh Luke Thomas and do you think though that I laughed in the final scene. You're waiting for this reveal of, of Sean Connery's character who was allowed to run, you know, and, and be let free by a good speed, which was a great sort of little twist there, uh, is given, you know, the Shawshank, come back to the beach and dig up your, your thing, but it's in, a, it's in some church in the middle of middle America. 
And then it's the uh, it's the it's the identity of who killed JFK. And I laughed at that being uh, conspiratorial in the way they tied that in throughout the movie. Was that enough of a hearty har har right off into the sunset moment for you for for how cool Sean Connery's character was? I thought so. I thought so. Because he was like, you know, forget Maui. Don't worry about Maui. You know, middle America, Kansas, whatever the, the exact location was. And then Nicolas Cage turns to, you know, his his uh, fiance and says, you want to know who killed JFK? I just thought it was like silly, but like the exact fun tie up all the loose ends in kind of a weird, interesting way. You know, again, not like super brilliant or something, but just kind of fun. remember June 7th, this movie was released in 1996. You know, these were the this was a time of uh, relative peace in the world. You know, again, relatively speaking. This was a time of not in Doha. Um, I'll tell you that much. All right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, again, and I, 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 I joined the military a year after this, basically, basically. Um, and so because for me, this, it's because like because of these Marines. Yeah. I, well, I will tell you like, the one thing that sort of sticks with me about this movie is like, I remember the joy I got watching this movie over and over and over and over again as a 16 year old kid, again, with nothing to do in Washington, DC. And then, you know, after the fact, when it came out on, on VHS and whatnot. And I remember, it's like, I, I honestly feel like this movie probably, you know, you everyone wants to say, and if you joined it like after college as an officer for like a career track, this is probably true. But for, or, or sorry, I should say, there's probably true that you joined for like some kind of very thoughtful, um, planned out reason, right? You went to the Naval Academy, blah, blah, blah. You, you, you really were thinking about how you would want to at least spend your 20s, if not the entirety of your 20 years after college in a career. But if you joined on the enlisted side, which I did, I mean, I joined and then went to college. There was no break. I just did both at the same time. So even though I had a college degree, I was still a member of the enlisted ranks. Uh, I, you know, people join for all kinds of reasons, money for college, um, cause their dad was in it because maybe the economy's not so great. Like everyone wants to like raise it up to be these great things. Why did you join the military? Did you know why a, a major reason was? Cause I thought the fucking rock was awesome. And I wanted to just, I don't know, have some small taste. I, I, I knew I wasn't going to do anything even remotely like that. And of course I did not, but you know, I don't know. There was just some kind of buzz and energy and, and, and thing about it as a stupid ass 16 year old kid. I wanted a little. I want a little taste of that, and I got it. And um, I, I, I would credit that more than any other recruiting meeting I ever had That's in hilarious. convincing me that that was something I wanted to do with my life. Uh, to your earlier point, it was nom the only major award it was nominated for was uh, uh, it was it was nominated for an Oscar for uh, best sound. But I'm very yeah. surprised when you look at the aggregated Rotten Tomatoes score that it holds up at 66% right now. And I'm not surprised because it is an action with movie. with critics or with audiences uh let's see uh the film left side has the screen right side uh, i'm on wikipedia but it has approval rating of 66 percent. oh it's only based on 65 reviews it's the it's yes, the, that's uh, the critics audiences give it 85 oh okay that makes sense because what i was going to say on that is you know that this this doesn't see even though this was you know my senior year of high school when this came out this doesn't seem all that dated it actually it actually felt kind of fresh and it didn't have a right. lot of the dated things we talk like you know harvey weinstein wasn't playing the dad of some you know church going girl in this movie there wasn't like some date really bad dated things outside of maybe the the slight marginalization of african americans and the lack of a strong female ro uh, role in this it, it holds up really damn well so i i did expect a a strong rating and if it did get 85 percent from the viewers um it's a great flick man i i could like yes right. i could I could stumble into this if this was back in the day on HBO. I could stumble this in, into this movie and rewatch it many times, Luke. All right. Well, with that in mind, let's get to some of these viewer responses. Um, we had, we actually asked the audience to participate, and they did. So this comes to us, I think, from a guy named Travis Ledbetter. If that's his real name, probably not. But here's what he says: I bet they call big him Yellow. Big fan of the show. Uh, big fan of the show and The Rock. I thought you'd enjoy some interesting Rock facts, BC. Arnold Schwarzenegger. We, we have. We by the way, I've not verified any of this. So take it for what yeah. it's worth. Arnold Schwarzenegger was originally offered the role of John Mason, but turned it down. Actually, I'll, I'm glad he did. That's a much better role for Nicolas Cage. No, Nicolas Cage. Sorry, sorry, um, sorry. Um, uh, Sean Connery. Sean Connery. Sean sorry. Con yeah, sorry, you're right. Sean Connery, as we said, added so much legitimacy where Arnold would have made this a great action flick, but not maybe a great flick. Where I think this was, this was as great as you can get for a blockbuster American action movie. And it was also a pretty damn good movie on with that. And I think that's because of Connery. Arnold could not have done that. And I'm an Arnold. Uh, Quentin Tarantino and Aaron Sorkin assisted on the writing, although remain uncredited. 
Really? Um, Nicholas Cage ad-libbed a lot of his lines, including Zeus's butthole. <laughs> when he's asking about how'd you get out of the, how, what, how in the name of Zeus's butthole did you get out of this? And that's when and he by the way, shout out to uh, and shout out to Cage Goodspeed being a big uh, vinyl guy, you know, big big uh, big audio file there, a man after my own heart, Luke. Okay. All right. You know, so Mr. Z says, I have loved very good. I have uh Mr. Z yeah. says, I have loved my girlfriend for many years. But the morning we found out Sean Connery had passed away, I asked her if she had ever seen The Rock. She turned to me and said, I take pleasure in gutting you, boy, just how it is said in the movie. I should probably put a ring on it. Thanks for all you do. Now, instead of listening to four different MMA podcasts, I only need one. That is one of my favorite lines, BC. I, yes. I, do I not quote it to you all the time? You do, and it's great. I, I think it might be number two in that flick behind Welcome to the Rock by Connery, in which I'd never seen this flick and used to quote that back in the 90s. So, like, that's how much that thing, you know, had a life of its own. And, uh, the one that I thought, the line that I hated in this movie was uh, when Nicolas Cage was like, you ever listen to Elton John? He's like, he goes, I don't listen to soft ass shit. <laughs> he goes, because you're the rocket man. And then he fucking hits the rocket and knocks him off the thing. I, I thought that awesome. was stupid. No, that was awesome. I, that was, I'm sorry. It was, was so, awesome. it was so, it was so dumb. But the one that I did like, small underrated line, same, re same relative scene is when one of the force uh, recon Marines is fucking up Sean Connery. And he goes, English prick. I ever tell you my old man was Irish? You know, he's boxing him up. <laughs> that was a nice one. Uh, Elwin asks, should Sean Connery have retired after The Rock? Now, what did he do after The Rock? I think he made a bunch of movies after that. Yeah, didn't I'm going to call it up. I got his IMDb Wikipedia entry, whatever you want to call it, right in front of me. And uh, so I believe he was 66 when he did the damn thing. Uh, hold on. I got it. It's one more. Oh, thing. no way, dude. He did a bunch of stuff after that. So he did uh, Entrapment, which was fun. He did right, Finding dude, Forrester, I the, which I thought was good. Hold on. I love the shit out of Entrapment. Saw it in the theater. And obviously that that scene. When I do this, you know what scene I'm talking about, right? Yes. But, Yes. Uh, where her butt is in the air. Uh, League of Extra Extraordinary Gentlemen sucks. True or false? You went to the theater to see that movie because of that tease in the trailer. Dude, True. back in the day, Catherine Zeta Jones was. <laughs> yeah. Hard yeah. to beat. Hard to beat. Yeah. Uh, he didn't do a whole lot of stuff after this. The only two things he did after The Rock of any kind of note BC were playing by heart and then finding Forrester. Entrapment was interesting. And I guess he played in The Avengers, but I don't even know which fucking movie that is because. Uh, it got 15% fresh on 5% fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. So that movie. So I, I think in, I didn't see Finding Forrester, but Entrapment was the, I think the last time he did something really awesome. Right. I mean, he, he was very physical yeah. in that movie and he was a, he was a suave gentleman as well. Okay. Uh, okay. We continue here. Just a couple more of these uh, from Scott. He says, Luke B and BC. He also mentioned someone else whose name I'm not going to read. Who J who uh, J who you savage uh, yesterday on morning combat uh you mean two days ago oh yeah uh Sorry. vanessa marcel what else is there to say gotta be top 10 hottest actresses from the list of the 1990s you want to talk about a sneaker or excuse me a sleeper call yeah this is not sneaky call. at all in your face not even sneaky yeah, yeah no. she, well, she was an absolute uh you know here's the thing though i looked up her filmography bc the rock in terms of movies is by far the biggest thing she had done her major hits came from television. She was on General Hospital, NYPD Blue, Spin City. She did 90210 after this, by the way. After this is when she started on 90210. Is that right? Yeah, and she was on uh, Las Vegas. Remember that? Remember that series that was uh, yes. in the 2000s? Short-lived, yes. short-lived, but yes. So she did a bunch of stuff in the early 90s and then later in General Hospital that weren't on, like, you know, 16-year-old pimply-faced, hormonally infused kids radars i don't think but in the rock she was you know top shelf and what do you want to do say? you know that she's only done five films that's shocking i, to I didn't i didn't until i looked it up but yeah that's that makes sense yeah i mean when you have uh, a long career in in like soap operas which is like a job that you'll always have unless they kill you off you i guess you don't right. need it luke you know right i looked her up on uh, instagram today she's still she's 51 52 she looks great so Keep that in mind. All right, last but not least, BC, here we go. Someone does. Someone did not like this movie from John. John says, I usually don't write because Luke usually stands for logic and reason and typically has measured, agreeable, or at least a sensible choice. But sadly, I'm afraid that this one is way off. 
Not only have I seen The Rock, but I also rewatched it for homework just to make sure my feelings were still true. I'm not sure if Luke has been ingesting any gas station hot dogs as of late, but I can't seem to figure out how on earth he could ever say The Rock is a good movie. Other than its connection to the military, I can't see as to what on earth would ever make him feel is justified to present this polished turd as homework. Is it the slow, dramatic shots of Nicolas Cage's face? Is it the corny one-liners from Sean Connery? Is it the absolutely ridiculousness of the plot? I understand it being a hilarious movie and considered being good from a comedic standpoint, but for the love of God, defend your claim of it genuinely being a good movie. I mean, Michael Bay's best movie? Luke, let's just put it in the dead wrong while we're at it. Jerry Bruckheimer. But uh, love the show and will always be a diehard fan, even though the technical difficulties make me want to rip my hair out. Thanks, guys. BC, what do you say? Well, I, I think he just sort of crapped on me as well because I just kind of went overboard and said it's a perfect installation of an American action blockbuster movie, and it's also pretty damn close to being a great movie. And I'm after dead wrong myself in that moment because, yeah, the plot is ridiculous. It's just that they pull off the ridiculousness so damn well that it makes you forget how ridiculous it is. So I will say that, again, because of the strength of the cast, the strength of the performances – and the fact that the action was so well done and it was so well shot. Yeah, they took a movie that wasn't supposed to be that good, if we're being honest, Luke, and they nearly made it great. So um, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with overblowing this. This is like when you have a rock band who's, you know, they're not going to be an all-time great band. They're not going to be like Pearl Jam and go on for 40 years, right? They're limited in their ability, but they put out a truly great rock record, right? Top to bottom, all killer, no filler five stars this is kind of what this movie is only they use some pretty well damn talented people to pull it off as well okay so now, I, i'm there's, okay now of course uh, don simpson and jerry bruckheimer were the producers the director was michael bay if you look at the uh, for what it is worth rotten tomato ratings the rock which, which came out in 1996 had both approval from critics and audiences 66 percent for critics the next one that he has that gets approval from the critics where it's considered fresh right is not till 2016 20 years later, which was Ouija, The Origin of Evil, and then he had two more, A Quiet Place, which I saw, which was pretty good, and then Bumblebee, which is one of the Transformer movies. Everything else he's put out has just been an absolute dud in terms of critic, uh, critical appeal. So I understand having Michael Bay uh, revulsion. The overwhelming majority of the shit that he puts out is really terrible, but this one to me is the exception that kind of proves the rule. Yes, it is silly. It is silly in a fun way. Yes, it is over the top, but it's over the top in a dramatic way. Yes, it is um, to a degree implausible, but it's that implausibility mixed with everything else we've talked about to this point that gives it a little bit of life. Uh, it's not going to, nothing is going to be good for everyone, BC, but I stand. Let's give some ratings on this one. I'll go first if I can. For me, I'm going to give this one a, a, a clear 9.2. One of my favorite action wow. movies ever. Um, it just it just so sentimental for me, you know, as a kid with a divorced parents, blah, blah, blah. I've told the story a million times. Love this movie. What do you think? Yeah, I gave it an 8.8, .8, which is which is strong and a really strong, actually. And uh, I don't think it was better than The Dark Knight. And I and I believe it. But it may have been more entertaining and rewatchable, though. And again, some of its parts, man, it had great parts. But look, again, this is a Michael Bay movie. This isn't the, you know, this isn't the greatest script. This isn't like something that has a moral lesson in it. And yet they pulled this shit off so well done. Uh, yeah, it was almost a nine. I mean, it was about an 8.8. .8. And um, real quick to get in the head of the government here, because this was, again, the part that I've wrestled with the most, the plausibility of would they have cared that much about 60 something tourists? Why not just blow up that island? How much do you think in the movie if this was a real scenario, so the, the threat of bioterrorism on a major city is a major threat. But do you think the idea of we'd be blowing up Alcatraz, we'd be blowing up a, a, a landmark came into play? And number two, the fact that they'd also be blowing up some decorated American soldiers that were that were leading this revolt. Did any would any of that have come into play to give them caution? I have no idea. I want to end this podcast.
All right. All right. We had a good run. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Tony Todd, by the way, of Platoon was one of the African American uh, recon members and yes. played Captain Darrell. Yes. Shout out to that guy. All right. Yeah. He, he did. He, he had an interesting role because he was sort of uniquely villainous in this one, uh, which, which, which worked, which worked. I'm just saying, you know, they didn't do a whole lot for, uh, they gave that little white guy who looked like, the short white guy from Shawshank Redemption, like a younger version of him. They gave that guy a little bit too much shine. He was like the last man standing, right? Trying to attack and and, and, and really yeah. push it. Um, all right. Well, we appreciate everyone who watched it. If you've not seen it, go see it. Tell us what you think. You can give us your review or feedback or whatever. Morningcombat at gmail.com. Let us know. Even if it's after the fact, just let us know what you guys had to say about it. We appreciate this uh, this bonus episode. Happy New Year to everybody out there. Be safe out there. Take it easy. Don't text and drive. Um, and we'll be back Monday. We'll do New Year's resolutions on Monday. We'll react to the Garcia fight, Rise in 26, the whole nine yards. BC, any final thoughts we get out of here? Uh, Luke and BC, make it look easy. There it is. For BC, I'm Luke Thomas. For Showtime, Malka, CBS Sports, and everybody else, appreciate you guys tuning in. Until next time, may all your gains be loyal.